Welcome to Different Like Me Culture with your host, Elise November, a licensed clinical social worker for more than 21 years who brings a brand new approach to learning by providing hands-on, interactive, web-based lessons that are easy to use and implement and focus on some of the most important topics in today's society. Bullying, dementia, special needs, relationship issues in 55-plus communities. These four topics are the focus of the Different Like Me Culture Program. For more information, call 561-270-2280 and begin your proaction approach towards these major challenges in our community. Call 561-270-2280 today and get started. Now, here's your host, Elise November. Hi, and welcome to Different Like Me Culture. I am your host, Elise November, and we are joined today by Ellen Morris, an attorney with Elder Law Associates, actually partner at Elder Law Associates uh, in Delray? Boca right, Town. Boca, Boca. Okay, I have been to your office. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I apologize for that. No problem. So let me tell you a little bit about Ellen. Um, Ellen is a attorney practicing for about 25 years, specializing in Elder Law and all types of litigation. Uh, she also does Medicaid, estate planning, and um, administ estate administration. Es estate administration. Probate. So if somebody, um, you, you help to plan and manage after somebody has passed. Right. Is that what that is? Yes. Okay. And executive, she's also executive counsel of the Elder Law Section of the Florida Bar. Bar. Board of, gosh, I didn't write this correctly. Board of, I'm, I'm on the board of the um, Academy of Florida Elder Law go. Attorneys. Right, and co-chair um, of the Joint Public Policy Task Force. Right. Yeah, that's a lot. You must be really busy. Yes. And I know you're really, really good at what you do as well. Thank you. So today we're going to talk a little bit about litigation in relation to elder law and pick up, pick up on some other topics. And you're going to teach me a lot too, and hopefully our audience as well. But I just want to let everybody know, if you have any questions, if you'd like more information on the topic we're talking about, um, you could give us a call at 888-565-1470 or tune in to watch us at WNN 1470 as well. Uh, so why don't we get started? And why don't you just explain, I guess, um, I guess to the layperson, what what does litigation involve? Or what, why would somebody call you? Why don't we start there? Sure, so in the elder law field, um, there are specific types of litigation that tend to come up repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, one, and, and by litigation, we, we kind of mean um, any time where we're working out a disagreement. So it may not mean bringing a full lawsuit. It may mean advocacy, let's say. For instance, in facility residence rights, your loved one is in a facility, maybe they're in an assisted living facility or they're in a skilled nursing facility. And there are sometimes issues that come up with the care plan, um, how they're going to be treated, or access of family members, um, that you need a, a, an advocate to help you through that. And, and we do have residence rights laws, both federal laws for residence rights and state Florida laws of residence rights. So sometimes I'm involved um, in that, and that's not usually a lawsuit or you know, full-blown litigation. So what would be a typical example of that, of that type of, where you would become involved? So if, give us a, like an example of where a family member might be experiencing something that they're not comfortable with that's going on at the facility. It sure. Would, what would it entail? Like why would somebody? Well, let me give you a few different examples. So oftentimes in today's world, we're dealing with blended families. So we're dealing with maybe second or third marriages and adult children maybe from a prior marriage. There sometimes is a push and pull or a tug of war over which family member has access to the resident, which family member has authority, which family member can gain information. Maybe they don't have authority to make decisions, medical, financial, or otherwise, but the resident had signed a HIPAA release, giving this person the ability to get 
private protected health information because they want them to know what's going on with their life but just not to make the decision so a lot of times there are these issues where I'm either called by a spouse or a family member who is just needs a little help getting access maybe to the individual where one family member um, maybe it's a spouse or maybe it's an adult child who has the authority has basically directed the facility not to allow the other family member in or to visit with the resident that's actually against the law and it's against the rights of the resident um, and unless there's a guardian appointed um, and unless that person's rights to socialization and to determine their visitation have been legally removed by a court of law nobody not even someone acting under a durable power of attorney or a health care surrogate has the right to exclude a resident from being visited by a family member so sometimes I'm guessing that comes into play because I deal with a lot of family members who I guess are concerned about other family members malintent disparaging um, maybe yes maybe to get them to possibly change things around or you know not give to this one or give to that one or right trying to manipulate situations or maybe they haven't been in the picture for a long time or maybe they have been in the picture for a long time and somebody else is trying to step in or right yes that and the manipulation be can be not only because they're afraid or trying to accomplish let's say legal document changes that can also be let's say between a brother and a sister that have never gotten along and we all know plenty of siblings who have sibling rivalry way into their 50s mm -hmm. and one sibling um, is passive aggressive and their way of achieving the edge on this sibling rivalry is preventing the other sibling from visiting mm -hmm. because they don't want the parent to remember visiting or they just want to say see he or she is not here as much as I am and it may not even be for any financial gain or it may not even be for control it just may be um, for their own malintent mm -hmm. or you know to to mold, mold the situation how they want it so yeah a, a residence rights issues mm -hmm. um, and we try and resolve that along with the facility all together in a more cooperative setting where we can bring the other family members in and we'll try to do it at a care plan meeting maybe we'll try and do it at an informal mediation because what the family members need to realize is that it's the residents best interest right that it matters and that and that's what gets mixed up I guess into everything is because you know we we're you're talking about like you walk in and you take a snapshot of what's going on right now but like we said that like you're saying there's there's so much past history that have has gone on and so many bad feelings that 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 the family members bring so much emotion to the table and it's so hard to decipher through all of that emotion what is best for the client or the patient or whomever it is that right. we're talking about right yeah. and it just kind of that gets blurred it's like almost like they they get pushed aside it's like well no it's me and you battling it out you know no it's my mom no it's my mom and yeah you're the, you, the only reason you moved to Florida is because you wanted all of mom's money so I'm sure you get all of that that right. madness a lot that of that goes on. and when they're in a facility I mean I I personally have never met a senior who's in a facility so they have some deficiency whether it's physical or mental or both that doesn't want to visit with their loved ones mm -hmm. you know it's one thing if the loved one is trying to do something improper exploitation or undue influence etc but I'm just talking about pure visitation spending time with someone in a facility who no one can tell me that they don't want to visit and spend time with as many of their loved ones as they can mm -hmm. so residence rights litigation definitely um, someone would come to see me for that then more of the um, full-blown litigation involves anything from a will contest to a trust dispute to um, you know an incapacity proceeding 
in a guardianship context. So in that in those litigations, a lot of times it is about money. Sometimes it's about control of the person. Uh, for instance, in a guardianship context, um, the siblings and, or spouses versus children, uh, typically from prior marriages, comes into play a lot. Um, sometimes it's not just the money, but it's the control of the person. Who's the one that's going to make the health care decisions? Who's the one that's going to have control over this incapacitated individual's health care, their visitation, their socialization, their residence, determining where they're going to live? So in a guardianship, um, and, and step back for a minute because people say to me all the time, oh, what about guardianship? And the first thing that I'm going to do and any good attorney is going to do is say, wait a minute, do you need guardianship? Guardianship is a case of last resort. It's easily avoided when someone who has capacity executes what we call advanced directives. That's a directive that you do in advance of becoming in capacity to say, I want this person to make my health care decisions for me, be my health care surrogate if I am unable in the future to make it for myself. Or I want this person to be my attorney in fact under a durable power of attorney if I am unable in the future to make those decisions or to manage my property for myself. So whenever we can avoid guardianship, we want to do so because the, the people that are losing in guardianship is the individual, the ward, or the individual who's accused of being incapacitated because their funds are going to be spent on this litigation, even if they're incapacitated, while these other people fight it out as to who has control. So make your decisions ahead of time. We say advanced directives should be executed from the time a, quote, child turns 18. Mm -hmm. When they're 18, they're an adult. And when they go off to college, they do not have to give their parents access to any information, health care, financial, academic, or otherwise in college. They should, when they turn 18, execute an advanced directive for power of attorney and health care surrogate so that, God forbid, there's an emergency if they didn't write it down that the school and the health administration or the hospital can speak that to their parents. Can, right, talk to them. Exactly. But I know also, because I've learned a little too, um, in speaking to attorneys, is there's a hierarchy of when, if God forbid something happens, that a hospital will go to, I guess, first a parent, right? If it's something called a health care proxy. Instead of a health care surrogate, it's called a health care proxy. So if you didn't execute an advanced directive, which is called a designation of healthcare surrogate, there is a statute for a healthcare proxy where there is a hierarchy. Yes, spouse, parents, siblings, et cetera. But that, there's a delay in having that hierarchy implemented, especially when you're not local. Mm -hmm. So if your child is going to school four hours away by car or two and a half hours away by plane and you can't be there in person, they're not going to speak to you over the phone until they get some documentation showing, number one, either you're the surrogate or number two, you meet the qualifications to be the proxy. And they're always worried about what if we speak to the wrong person? For instance, right. what about in a situation where parents are divorced? I'm just going to bring that up. So yes, absolutely. Or maybe they won't agree or maybe one has been there all along and then maybe there was a primary residential parent who has been taking the child to the doctor and gets all of the medical issues, and the other one just says, oh, yeah, you're just the, you know, the overprotective parent, and there's probably nothing wrong, right? So, yeah. you so have those there's, types of issues, I'm guessing. And the advanced and directive. And everything in between. Yeah. And everything in between. And yeah. the advanced directive document, if you get used to doing it when you're 18, and, you know, maybe you revise it again when you're married in your late 20s, and maybe you revise it again you know, when, if God forbid, you know, you, you lose a spouse or you have a divorce or, you know, so many life cycle events, if you get used to executing them all the way along, you will ensure that your wishes are fulfilled without other people fighting and spending your money mm -hmm. unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. 
But there are still times where we, we do have guardianship and guardianship litigation. Okay, so I have a question about litigation as far as a will. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you hear stories that judges typically don't overturn what somebody has written in their will. And I could be wrong, and the people who have told me that couldn't be wrong. But, you know, what, when, when, let's say, let's say mom says, um, you know, I want daughter A to have everything. She's been here for me. Daughter B has disappeared from my life, hasn't been here. Her and her kids, they never, they haven't been a part of my life at all. I want daughter A to have everything. Mom dies. Daughter B, of course, says, well, she's my mom too. You know, just because I haven't been in her life doesn't mean I shouldn't have anything. But the way mom wrote it is daughter A and her family gets everything. Daughter B gets nothing. That's that's valid. And, and you're right. There's a there's a legal presumption once um, execution is proven that it was a valid will and executed with proper formalities as required by Florida law. Then the burden of proof shifts to, for instance, daughter B who would be trying to overturn the will. Um, that's a litigation that I'm involved with, you know, a lot, unfortunately. Um, it's a tough case to bring um, because there are a few reasons why you can overturn a will or the presumption of a will. One could be undue influence. Daughter A isolated mom, um, threatened mom that if she didn't get everything from mom, she wasn't going to take care of her anymore. Daughter A found the lawyer that mom went to to sign her will. Prior, uh, mom had a diminished capacity. Not Maybe not totally incapacitated, but some form of diminished capacity. Daughter A sat in on the meeting with the lawyer. Daughter A paid the lawyer. Mom's prior will left everything 50-50 to daughter A, daughter B, and it was only after mom started experiencing this diminished capacity and after daughter A started exerting undue influence, did mom change her will? So these are all factors that could lend to a will being overturned by undue influence. And there are burden shiftings, which are more legal and technical than we should get into okay. here, but that go on in this litigation, meaning I prove that the will was executed in conformity with the Florida law. You now have the burden to say that the will uh, was executed by undue influence or by lack of testamentary capacity. Um, and then the, if, if you meet your burden, then the burden shifts back to me to say, no, there wasn't undue influence. Yes, daughter A did find the lawyer. And yes, um, mom did have a diminished capacity. Um, but the, here's all the reasons. Daughter B never visited. Um, mom met with lawyer by herself. Daughter A was not there and was not in the room. And mom articulated to the lawyer exactly the reasons why she was omitting or disinheriting daughter B, et cetera. So it's sort of a push and pull and a back and forth over there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, um, as long as the lawyer who prepared the will took, there are many steps that the lawyer can take to avoid the presumption of undue influence, like making sure that they meet alone with mom or dad, the testator, um, making sure that the testator has the basic capacity to execute a will. Who, who, what is the nature of your assets that you'll have when you die? Who are the natural objects or people who would receive your assets when you die. Well, it's naturally daughter A and daughter B, but I don't want daughter B for these reasons. Mm -hmm. And if the lawyer goes through that process, which we do in our office, of course, especially when we there's any hint of any possible litigation, I'm always brought in, um, since my partner Howard Crooks doesn't do litigation, I, I'm always brought in to make sure, because when you... When like, you okay. Ellen, listen, because if there's anything that you think that if somebody contests it, we could kind of be called up on, yes, right. ask every we question. We take care of that. That's wonderful that you guys have that team where if somebody is leaving daughter B out, you are brought in. And that's just that's just a, just a wonderful plus that you kind of have a bird's eye view as to what might happen later on down True, the line. True, because there are a lot of estate planners who really just do planning. They just do 
wills, trusts, and we call that more transactional. They don't do litigation, and they do their best to make sure that their documents are going to withstand any later challenge or litigation later. But if you if you already know that there's a you're omitting someone, you're just inheriting someone to have the perspective of a of a litigator, yeah. um, it it we find that it, it helps. It adds a, a very necessary dimension. I think it's great because I mean we're just talking because you know that my husband's a neuropsychologist, so I know every once in a while he's called in on the testamentary capacity. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. So if somebody has a memory disorder and they're looking to change their will. And like you said, I see a red flag here where somebody might contest it later on down the line. Well, let's show that you have testamentary capacity to make these decisions right now before That's right. we move forward. Let's send you and to the you neuropsychologist. Would it, you would see a red flag immediately. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like he even comes to your, the office and he will be there and says, okay, sign the papers and sign the papers right now, five minutes, you know, or within five minutes of Contemporaneously with his testing. examination. And so that, I'm guessing if you had something like that, that would, if somebody Absolutely. wanted to contest it, that would, you would have proof. You would have some type of proof to say, well, we had a professional in there. You know, you get them on the stand, and yes, she had testamentary capacity. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. So um, we use that. We it, The same is true for, for trusts. Um, a lot of people use trust planning now. We use uh, trust planning a lot rather than it used to be all you talked about was a will Mm -hmm. Um, but a will causes probate probate is not this big bad ugly monster that everyone talks about sometimes it's necessary why don't you like explain it because i mean even me being in the field i don't understand everything about it so what is probate because yeah everybody's like avoid probate right right it's like this and you're like why ugly monster what is it exactly So, so um all probate is Um, is when an individual dies with assets that are just titled in their name. So it just says Elise November. It doesn't say Elise November and husband. It doesn't say Elise November in trust for husband. It doesn't say Elise November in trust for kids. It just says Elise November. Mm -hmm. And it's a bank account, let's say, that just says Elise November. Or it's a stock portfolio that's just titled under Elise November. Or it's a piece of real estate that's just titled under a lease November. When someone dies leaving those assets just in their name, you have to probate the will. So meaning? that's where it comes from, meaning you have to file a petition in the probate circuit court saying to the judge, judge, here's the will. Here's what the will of a lease November says. Here are the assets that are just in a lease November's name. We need her husband to be appointed the personal representative of Elise November's estate so that someone has authority that all the banks and the real estate people and everyone else will look to for his okay for what happens with those assets. And here's how those assets are going to be distributed and it's all blessed by the court and creditors, you're out there, American Express, Visa, MasterCard, hospital, doctor's bills, whatever creditors Elise November has because you were living your life and you had bills and you incurred expenses, the personal representative has an obligation to notify those creditors and for those creditors to put in their claim, Elise November owed me X amount of dollars and to either pay those creditors with Elise November's assets or object this claim is wrong. This claim was paid. This bill is improper, etc. And at the end of the day, the court will determine, okay, here's all the assets. These creditors are paid. This is what's left to be distributed to Elise November's heirs or the people in her will that she directed. And personal representative, you go ahead and do that. And then your duty is over and probate's over. It's not a horrible thing. It's a legal process that delays receipt of the beneficiaries, let's say, from receiving what they're ultimately entitled to because we've got to pay the creditors and we've got to go in and get court authority. There are some times, though, when it's very necessary, when an individual says, I don't have anyone that is really handling my affairs for me while I'm alive. I don't want to put anyone on my account as a joint owner or as a pay-on-death beneficiary because 
I don't trust anyone and I don't want anyone to have that access or have my private information and I know I'm going to have expenses and I just want to name this person and if if it costs a little bit extra or if it's a little bit of delay, I want to make sure that all of my affairs are handled properly the way I want them and I want the court to bless it. There are many reasons why you'd want that to happen. Uh, Could be family situations. Again, could be that you really don't have anyone that you want to make your co-trustee or your joint account holder, etc. We do try and avoid it because it is more of a burdensome process and a delay by using revocable trusts, also known as living trusts, right? Okay. And everyone talks about revocable trusts or living trust planning. We use that to avoid probate. That's one reason to avoid that that process. But the other reason is so that while you're alive, you may be the sole trustee. I like to think of it as the trust is the ship and you are the captain of Mm -hmm. your ship. So while you're alive and you're capacitated, you're steering the boat, steering your ship. You're making all your decisions. You're the captain. You decide when to invest, what money to spend, what money to give. Basically everything you can do in your own name, you could do under your revocable trust. But if you become incapacitated, even just temporarily, let's say you go in for an operation, surgery, and you're temporarily incapacitated, there is someone else that you name already in place to be the backup captain, your co-captain. Somebody who knows what you want to be well, done, well, basically. Well, all they have to do is follow the terms of the trust. It's all laid out in the document. And they have so to. It's almost like a, a, a ship plan or a navigation plan. Here okay. comes this co-captain. And they don't really have to make a lot of their own decisions or any of their own decisions. Sometimes the trust allows for them to make some of their own decisions, but a lot of times they're just following the plan. They're following the plan in the trust, just like you would if you are a co-captain. The captain's off right now. You're steering, you're steering that ship. And you're you're following the navigation you plan, uh-huh. and then you might That's turn it back analogy. over to the captain. Uh-huh. Or you might, if the captain never regains the ability to steer the ship, you might continue it on. And in a trust planning, when the testator or the, the trustor or grantor dies, the co-trustee can do a simplified trust administration and the money um, can get to the beneficiaries mm-hmm. faster and the um, cost is less, etc. Very good. That's great. I love, I love that analogy that you gave of steering the boat. So I'd like to thank Ellen uh, for joining us today. She's from Elder Law Associates. And if somebody wanted to reach you, how would they do it? Why don't you give them a phone number and we'll give them a website too. Sure. It's 561-750-3850. Five zero and the five six one seven five zero three eight five zero or one eight hundred elder law. That's one eight hundred elder law. And our website is uh, www.elderlawassociates.com. Thank you. Thank My you pleasure. so much. Thank, Thank you, you, you for having me. It's been me. a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to Different Like Me Culture with Elise November. Join us every Monday at 6 p.m. Call 561-270-2280 for more information. And tune in again next week for more Different Like Me Culture.